Okay, so again, I am Dr. Kim Godwin. I am with MTSU Online, and today we're going to talk about measuring instruction hours in online courses. We will also reference a little bit face-to-face um, -face courses because it actually does apply in both as well as remote and hybrid and what that might look like. And what is too much, what is too little, and what is just right. So kind of, you know, think your, your Goldilocks um, and your three little bears on this one. Um, we're looking for the right set of porridge. Uh, by the conclusion of this workshop, you should be able to describe cognitive load theory. We're going to talk about that briefly, uh, but that is one actually, uh, I'll go ahead and mention it now and then I'll probably mention it again. If that is something that y'all are interested in knowing more about or really discussing more in depth, please make a comment about that um, either during this presentation or in your evaluations that you complete because um, it, it, it's a great topic, but I actually want to make sure that we cover a little bit on it, but I want to talk to y'all about how to actually do a couple of things um, and leave this presentation with some particular skill sets and ready to go out and um, try some things. Um, so I can get lost in theory. So if y'all want to talk about that, please make sure you make a note of it and we'll get that on the schedule. I don't know that it'll happen this semester, but we'll make sure that it gets out there somewhere. Um, we're also going to consider and prioritize primary themes and concepts in your course. And we're going to feel confident. We're going to feel confident using the course load estimator and or the MTSU online instruction hours chart. Uh, so I'm going to give you a couple of resources that you'll be able to use. Um, and I say feel confident because sometimes if we haven't ever tried something before, we're a little bit nervous about it. Um, so this is just a chance for us to practice something in real time. Um, and um, I will uh, make sure that y'all actually also get a link to that um, in the chat here shortly. And you will be able to um, take a look at it too while we're talking. So if you you know want to minimize me in a little bit and play around, you're welcome to. Um, th that is actually a direct conflict to cognitive load theory. It's okay. I'll let you do it. All right, so what is too much, too little, and just right? So when we're thinking about a course, any course that you teach um, or that you have taken, do you or your students ever feel overwhelmed? Have you ever had that moment um, that so much was coming at you that you just weren't even sure where to start or um, how to even get going? Um, or, or what step to take. Um, we've kind of addressed some of those things throughout the year of ways that we might be able to help people with tools in D2L, but what are what is it that has made you feel overwhelmed? And you don't actually have to respond unless you feel comfortable doing it, but I really want you to start thinking about when you're in that moment and how you feel, uh, and then how do you think your students are feeling when that's happening with them? Are they having that same moment of overwhelmed and stress and anxiety when too much is coming at them at one time. How do you measure contact hours in a face-to-face -face hybrid or remote course? Does anybody know how we do that? Yeah, so in the MTSU's academic affairs, uh, you can actually find the information and policy about that uh, a credit hour uh, and how that's determined is 15 hours of contact and then an additional 30 to 45, that kind of varies, uh, depending on um, your, your course and your course level per credit hour. So in a typical three hour class, we have 45 hours of contact in a face-to-face -face remote uh, class um, and hybrid is a maximum of 15 according to MTSU online. But um, so it's about 45 for a typical three hour class and then another 90 ish of outside of class instruction and connection with the materials and learning. So we're looking at about 135 total hours of instruction that a student will have in any given three hour class, give or take just a little bit. Um, so kind of want y'all to keep that in the back of your mind and, and where we get those numbers and how we get those numbers and why those numbers are important. Um, they really are important for accreditation purposes and measuring that our students are actually getting that contact that they need. 
because we are not using competency-based education for most of our courses. Um, that is a whole different ball game in terms of how we measure instruction. So if MTSU decides that we're going to do competency-based uh, instruction, then we'll have a whole different kind of conversation about how we find instruction. But uh, for now, we're just looking at in terms of a traditional course, a three hour course that lasts throughout the span of whatever our term is, whether that three week, five, six, 14, 12, if it happens to be a COVID slash snow semester, you know, it all just depends on what's happening in the world. Um, so about 135. So just kind of keep that in mind. Um, does anybody know how we might measure that in an asynchronous online class? Right. So that's probably why y'all are here is to really figure out how we do that. Um, and before I go too far into it, I, I kind of wanted to preface you with what are some of the biggest pitfalls that we have in online education in terms of content um, and measuring instruction and how we get to those hours. So in an online course or even a remote course, has anyone ever found a resource and added it to their class? Anybody ever done that? So I've been guilty of it too, that even after the class is going, I find a resource and I add another resource to a class. And then the next time I teach it, that resource is there. And I wanna keep it because it's a great resource. And so I, I kept that one. And then I found another one and I thought that one was amazing. So I put it in there. The big issue that happens within online and even remote learning is that we keep adding new resources as new things become available. Oh, this amazing new video or this new website link or a great new article that was just published. But are we thinking about what it is that we're removing from our course as we're adding something new? It is very easy in an online environment to keep adding and keep adding and keep adding and keep adding. And then suddenly our 135 hour course has 400 hours of instruction in it. We're overwhelmed. Our students are overwhelmed. They're not really sure where to go or where to start or how to kind of get that process going because there's just so much. Uh, and they get to a point of cognitive overload where their brain really just says, I can't take any more. Um, and that's really what that feeling of overwhelmed is that we get uh, when there's too much going on in a course or, you know, we don't know where to start or where to go next. So it really is dealing with that concept. So I want to talk just a little bit about that cognitive load theory that I mentioned previously. Um, it's not really a new theory, but it's, it's one that people talk a lot about, especially when um, you're starting an online course development or you're thinking about how you're going to do an online course or a remote course moving forward. Um, the structure of face-to-face -face really does kind of help with the, you have 45 hours of face-to-face -face, and then you have an additional two to three hours outside of class per hour that you are in class. So that makes that measurement just a little bit easier. And typically that out of class is where we think that they are reading their textbook. Um, notice I said that we think that they're reading. We know they don't always read every word. Um, but we want them to be reading their textbook or their resources or that information. It's when they're working on a class project um, or they're preparing for an assessment. The assessment time itself would count as in class, but the preparation would count as part of that two to three hours out of class um, that they would do to make up for that hour. So cognitive load theory. Um, what it really comes down to is thinking about how we retain information and how much information we can, as learners, take in at any one time and process through and create long-term memory out of it. It's how we get from I don't know to know. It's that process right there in the middle. And one of the points that I think is important for us to cover as we're talking about this is we are all experts in what it is that we do. You are a subject matter expert in your field. You are an expert at educating your students. You are experts at learning because you have been learning for a very, very long time. Um, not saying that any of you are older than anyone else, but you've been learning your whole life. So if you're older than say a first time entering freshman that may have graduated from high school a few months ago, you have been learning longer than they have. 
you also have gone through the process of getting a few degrees. So you've learned along the way how you best learn and how you best process information and take things from your short term to your long term um, concepts of knowing and learning. And the reason I'm pointing that out is I want you to try to think about that when you're thinking about creating uh, workloads and um, cognitive load for your students. You are over here. They are over here. Uh, they are not as versed in being professional learners as we are. It's what we do. It's what we do for a living. It's what we enjoy doing with our lives. It's how we ended up here. We're really good at it. Um, our level of error is, is less. Um, it doesn't take us quite as long to uh, necessarily apply some of those ways of learning, knowing and learning unless you are deciding to take a course in something that you've never learned about. And then you will have that same moment of overwhelmed or, okay, I need to stop and think about what's being said. I need to really stop and process that. You may need to go back and revisit uh, and hear some of that information again or read some of that information again. It may help you as we're talking about cognitive load to down the road, uh, go back and take a look at some of the resources that, um, that we've added to this um presentation and how we might help you get that extra information like on cognitive load or some of the extra resources we put in there and you will get this presentation at the end uh, so that's how we think about how we structure our learning and thinking about how our students might structure learning so if you're developing a course for first semester freshmen thinking about their level of load versus a doctoral student they, they can handle different levels of workload because of where they are in the process of knowing how to learn. Um, so I hope that that kind of makes a little bit of sense with that. If it doesn't, we'll chat about it later. Um, so really the cognitive load is about addressing how much and how we learn along the way. And the thing I wanted to kind of point out was the knowledge void. I don't. I don't know if y'all know about the knowledge void. I don't know if it's something that you think about often, but there's kind of two concepts with the knowledge void. There's the, uh, we don't know what we don't know. So if you've ever run into a situation where you, you didn't know that you needed to ask something and someone made a statement about, oh, isn't this just common knowledge? Well, you didn't know you didn't know. You didn't know that you needed to ask. Um, I've been racking my brain about examples to give y'all about that. Um, but I guess one of them would be um, if, if you have to change a flat tire, when you go to tighten the lug nuts, you're supposed to do it in a certain order, um, depending on how many you have, but it's like a star. So you're not tightening them next to each other because that creates better balance in your tire. If you've never changed a tire and no one has ever told you that that's what you need to do with lug nuts, that is a knowledge void. You didn't know that you didn't know how to do it. You figured, oh, I'll just put them back on and everything's fine. It's giving people that extra little bit of knowledge to help them know and not assuming that there is a level of knowledge that they already have. And the other side of the knowledge void is we forget what it was like not to know a thing. Once we know, it's very hard for us to go back and think, what was my life like before I knew that thing? And we run into that a lot in higher education. Um, we don't necessarily think about the fact that at one point we didn't know some of that introductory information in that led to the upper division course that we are teaching. We don't necessarily think about the fact that we didn't have that piece of knowledge. Um, my undergraduate is in history um, and it's in history and civil rights education. So, um, you know, in order for me to have gotten to that point that I have that degree, I had to have learned some pretty important historical facts along the way to get to a point that I could have an emphasis in something like civil rights education. So what did I not know before? Well, I forgot what happened before once I got to the point that I knew so much more about what happened in the 60s and what I see every day. Um, I forgot that there was a time before I knew that information. So you have to step back and think about it in terms of 
if I am a blank slate as an instructor, I am a blank slate as a student, what is it that is the first thing that they need to know to help them get to the second thing, to the third thing, to the fourth thing? So I hope that makes a little bit of sense. So determining priorities. This was where I mentioned earlier that in two weeks, there is a presentation on um, aligning student learning outcomes. And so I'm only gonna talk on this just for a second because there's an entire hour long presentation in two weeks that I encourage you to sign up for that we're gonna talk about this in a little bit more detail, but I wanted to touch on it because it's so important with load um, and cognitive workload and, and specifically cognitive overload. So when thinking about um, one of your courses, how do you determine what a student needs to know? And I left y'all a little tip there. This is actually interactive. How do you know, as a faculty member, how do you determine this? And y'all can post in the chat or you can unmute um, and let me know how you get there. What are the things that help you determine what it is that is the greatest priority in your course? I'll give you one and then maybe that might spark some. So your course learning objectives might give you an idea of what the main priorities are for your course. Um, does that, is that where a lot of you start? And there was silence. I'm okay with silence. I'm good at it. Well, and feel free to use your emoticons at the bottom too, or your reactions if you agree. <laughs> but don't want to say anything specifically. Yep, that's totally fine. Um, and it's fine. Uh, typically, the course learning objectives are where we start uh, with what it is that we want our students to know at the end of a given course. Um, they're structured, they're typically agreed upon. Um, I see in there that um, one of the departments uh, created a set of learning objectives for their survey course. It's great that it was a whole department and that's where y'all got together on that. Oh, backward design. Thanks, JP. <laughs> um, yes, this touches very much on backward design. Um, and yes, history rules. Um, so yes, it does touch on backward design and beginning with the end in mind. Uh, and what are those major priorities for our course? I also like to touch here for just a second on um, if we have a textbook in our course and our textbook has 27 chapters. Do we feel obligated to teach all 27 chapters in one course term because they're in the textbook? Do our, there's a note in the chat. Um, great. Um, sometimes that happens that we feel obligated that, oh, it's in the textbook, so I have to teach it because they have to know it. That's, yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> a textbook is a resource, just like any other resource, and you pick and choose what's useful for your learning objectives. Um, I also never feel any responsibility to take it in order. You know, fairly often I feel they're very poorly ordered, you know, so I choose what I think they need to know first and assign it fairly randomly, really. I appreciate that. I do that too. Anytime there's a text in any of my classes, I'm like, and now we're going to look at chapter 15 and then yeah. two. And then I'm all over the place because it's about how I think that their learning needs to be structured. Um, and, and printed books are not always in that order. Um, so yeah, I mean, that really is where that concept comes from is what is it that we need them to know? I've, I've seen some examples where people had courses that, that, textbook had 18 chapters and they wanted to cover them all. So they just put all 18 into a course um, and students tend to start feeling overwhelmed as do the faculty members. That is a whole lot to cover. And how much of that are they gonna know? Are they gonna remember? Um, if we're slamming in 18 chapters worth of information into a three, five, six, seven, 14, week semester or term, how much of that are we going to process? If we think back on that load theory, we need some time when someone presents information to process that information and make that connection, kind of revisit it a little bit, hear it again, 
commit it to our long term. If we're trying to cram in too much stuff, it makes it really difficult in order to to process that uh, and how we get there. So a lot of it really does have to do with thinking about what are those primary things you want them to learn. Yes, we want them to know all of that information that might be available across a degree program when they graduate and go out and get a job, but they don't have to learn all of those things to mastery level, everything they ever needed to know when they graduate in an introductory class. So really thinking about in this course, what are the four or five things they need to know to be successful and move on to the next one? Well, I talked over, so. Um, there you go. So how much time do we spend on new content within those courses and how do we choose that time? How much time do we revisit? And then this is just a question for you in terms of online and I guess a uh, hybrid and remote. Do you use the end feature on your modules in your courses? And if so, what is the reason that you use it? Just curious. All right, I'm gonna ask a question. Sure. What is the end feature? I've never seen that. I am not going to tell you what it is because I don't want you to use it. <laughs> well, I can say that I wouldn't use it anyway because history is one of those, those subject areas where you build upon stuff from the previous week. And I'm constantly asking them to refer back to previous week's work to supplement what they're already doing. Because history, as you know, because you're an awesome history geek, um, is, a, is a connected process. So I would never use it anyway. Absolutely. That is exactly the reason that we actually discourage the use of the end, um, regardless of your content field. Um, one of the things that research shows about online learning and, and how it is that students process the information and continue to improve as they continue taking courses is the ability to continually go back and revisit information. They can go back in time of the course and visit something that, oh, I remember we talked about that, but I don't remember all of that information. I'm gonna go back to module two and I'm gonna revisit that. So here's the great thing that happened with that. Student can get back to it and it can be reinforced, which as we talked about is part of that learning process. In the very beginning, I was talking about cognitive load and how we can take things in small increments and we need to revisit. Um, that really does deal with that. It gives them that opportunity to go back and revisit. And we may know that a student needs us to go back and revisit a concept until they turn in an assessment that they totally missed the boat, um, which I'm sure has happened sometimes. Um, and or they ask. Uh, and I don't I don't know about you, but sometimes in my face to face classes, students don't ask me. Um, if we can go back and revisit something. I may instinctually know from previous times that I've taught the course that there are concepts that are more difficult and we need to continue to revisit until we have that understanding and that mastery of the skill. But if we don't know that students don't know, we aren't gonna necessarily go back and revisit it in our courses. So having your course open after someone completes a module and moves to the next one, gives them that opportunity to continually go back and revisit and scaffold that information and keep building on that knowledge so that it becomes part of their long-term memory and their ways of learning and knowing and mastering how they. So it looks like we're having a technology issue, clearly. <laughs> it's not, I'm sure she would really appreciate someone taking a screenshot of that pose that she's frozen in. Um, <laughs> So I'm uh, hopefully, yes, and I'm still here. Um, so I don't know what's happening on her end uh, exactly or what, frankly, we're gonna need to do about that. Um, I can actually talk a little bit more about determining priorities while we hopefully figure out what's happening. Um, and she comes back into the class, but I think you're kind of getting the gist. I also put something in the chat about that's why we recommend lock and unlock dates rather than end dates and things because we always want students to be able to go back and access the information. Now, I'm not saying that's true necessarily for a test or for an assignment, right, that they're submitting. But when it comes to that content information and getting to know 
or getting be able being able to refer back to those instructional materials to those discussions that help them think through information it's really really important um, and I think that's where she was headed with that conversation um, one moment <laughs> she's working on it she will be back in in just a minute <laughs> she's trying to fix it um, so I sent you I don't know if you have the opportunity to look at it I sent in the chat our um, estimator the Excel spreadsheet I hope you were all able to get it um, it also just to clarify has an undergrad and a grad tab Gra yeah grad tab <laughs> Um, it has both because the, the measuring amounts are a little bit different depending on the level of the course, right? Because the undergrad course would definitely be different than a grad course. Hey, she's back. <laughs> uh, so we talked about, we reinforced about end dates and talking about lock and unlock dates. Uh, so I'm going to restart our recording and then I'm going to screen share again and we will get right back to where we were. Um, so here we were, um, in our little chart. So this is the um, course load estimator. And I will make sure to make it big enough because my screen makes things really small when I share them. Okay, so this is the course load estimator. This is just one example and it is from Rice University. And it's actually a, a pretty good example. Um, if you are looking to think about where you are in terms of your instruction hours. And remember, we're aiming for um, about 135. So kind of keeping those things in mind. But part of what I wanted to talk to you about on this estimator, and thank you for sharing this information, Tara. Um, part of what I wanted to talk to you about on this estimator is specifically in here, in reading and writing and thinking about time. And remember earlier when I mentioned that um, the longer we've been learning, the easier it is for us. Um, same goes with the longer we've been reading and the longer we've been writing. Um, the more we read academic journals, the faster we get at academic journals. If you think back to early on in your career, even if you think back to early on in your graduate career and someone gave you an academic journal, it was probably a challenge to get through it. Um, yeah, it's probably a challenge because there's just so much to them and they just, they don't read like the fun, cozy mysteries you might read on a Saturday when it's raining. It is like deep information. Well, now after you've been reading those for a couple of years, um, because right, we're all just fresh out of graduate school. We've only just done that. Um, after you've been reading them for a couple of years, you get a lot better about how to read them and how to process that information and words that you may not have known when you started reading them are words that you don't have to stop and think about what does that word mean or what are they saying? They become second nature to you. So the reason I'm reminding you of that is when you're thinking about determining levels of reading and determining levels of writing, think of, think back to what it was like to not know. So, if you're thinking that, oh, it's not a lot of new concepts because you know they're not new concepts to you, are you thinking about the fact that they are a lot of new concepts to your students? Uh, so maybe if it's something new, many new concepts. Um, page density. Um, so how big is your font and how dense is the information on that page? Um, you know, is your page kind of, the information's a little bit easier to read. It's not quite as condensed. Thinking back to academic journals, that font is always like 0.2. Um, and then they put a bunch of codes and parentheses and stuff in there. And you're like, oh my gosh, words. Um, so really thinking about what is your density of your page uh, and what does that look like? So I'm going to kind of show you an example. So here is a 450. Let's say we're going to read, um, 15 or 25 because my finger was in the wrong place. So 25 pages per week. It's about 450 words. We're actually going to go with the no new concepts and the purposes survey. So it estimates that that is really about 67 pages per hour because you're really just kind of reading over it. It's like a review. You're probably not looking at it too in, intent. Um, you're just really rushing over the top of it. It's, it's some new concepts. Okay, well, let's now look at 
Um, and do know also this is a range. Some of us read much faster and some of us read much slower. So try to kind of keep that in mind um, with information like that. So let's look at it now with 750 words, many new concepts, and it is for the intent of engage. That is five pages per hour. Uh, so if you have them reading um, 100 pages per week, um, that's, that's, that's a lot of reading for one week unless we're like up in the graduates. But if you have them reading that and you're thinking about your, your course hours and you're thinking about your, your load and your cognitive load and what students are able to process, if it's five pages per hour and you have 25 pages and they are are dense like this one, and it's really for them to be at the highest level of engagement, you are already at five hours of course instruction from 25 pages of reading. And that may not seem like too much because you have 135 hours to get to in your course, but that's five hours from one reading activity. How many of these types of reading activities do you have in your course? How many do you have spread out over the length of your course? So if you had them doing this every single week for 14 weeks, you, you're getting on up there. You're at like 70 hours of instruction from just this reading, uh, which means you've only got about half left for everything else that you want to do in your course. Um, so, and part of why I say that is for you to really kind of think about what kind of reading. So maybe instead of having really dense every single time, some that's a little less dense or some that's a little bit more dense so that there is that variance of, of learning how to process that reading at a different level. And of course, as I showed you, if it's survey and, and I'll check and, and more spread, and I, it's yes. not going to, you're going to be able to read a whole lot more um, than you would with feel better something that's like this in depth. Um, plan. Okay. So let's look at, at, writing um, and how we we write and, and what we're thinking about. So let's think of it in terms of we're going to do two pages, um, our 250 words, uh, and we're going to go with reflection and narrative. Um, and we'll just do no drafting. So that only takes us about uh, three fourths, about 45 minutes um, to do something like that because it's reflective. Um, it, we're talking about our own experience with the information. It doesn't take us as long to process something like that. Um, if you start adding in, um, here's your reflection and you need to support it with research, then it be starts becoming a, a longer amount of time, more information is being engaged in it uh, and how we do that. So let's look at the same two pages. Um, we'll even keep it at 250 words, but we're going to switch it to research. I just jumped up to three hours per page. So you went from 45 minutes to three hours just by changing it from reflective to research. Um, so you and I may not need three hours unless you're like me. And when I start researching something, I end up going down a massive wormhole and it takes me 50 forevers to do something because I get sucked into the awesomeness of things that I find. Um, so if you're like me, it may actually take you that long to do a reflective paper because you're like, oh, let me think about this other thing and let me go look at this thing. So that happens to me. I just assume it happens to everyone. If it doesn't, you're so lucky. Um, but that is my life. <laughs> so that was why I really wanted to show you this estimator was to kind of get you to start thinking about in terms of how you learn, um, ways that you process the information, but how might your student process that information? And how might we determine what some of those hours look like? And as you can see, you actually will do that with um, exams uh, or tests that you have, and then your expectation of how many hours you think that they will study for that exam. That is a guess. Y'all know some people study for like they turn it on and that's the extent of their study. Other people will study for like 40 hours for a 15 minute quiz. So again, with that whole kind of think about things in on average, uh, where are people going to be with that? And then other assignments that you might have in this semester. So, um, and one to think about in terms of that assignment, if you have something like um, a larger culminating project, 
that's not just one assignment. That is the steps along the way. Each one of those would be considered an assignment. Um, or if it is one that they're not necessarily turning things in throughout the semester um, or your term, thinking about each of those components within that culminating project, even if they're turning it in all as one thing, that those would be individual assignments. So really thinking about how much that time um, is happening for each of those times. Um, so as you can see, uh, or at least I think you can see, so right now it was just set at a 15 week semester. Um, and our estimated work is 5.4 out of class hours per week. Um, and so what this is telling you is with just these, we are at 5.4 per week at 15 weeks. We are well on our way to reaching our, um, our goal for 135. And this is only for out of class. This doesn't count if you are actually a face-to-face um, or a remote and you're doing in class lecture and activities. That is the additional time, the 45 hours that your students are already getting the 15 per credit hour. So you've already got those 45 if you're face to face. Um, so that's where some of those times come from. So I really do encourage you in one of your classes, um, you know, maybe after the semester ends, um, take a look and kind of measure out some things and see where you are. Uh, and you may actually find out one of two things. You may find out that you are overloading yourself and your students. You may also find out the opposite direction that you're not actually challenging them enough because um, that does happen sometimes. Um, so does anybody have any questions about the course load estimator before I go into explaining that Excel chart? Because I know Tara talked about it a little bit, but I didn't know if anybody had any questions. This is not a direct question about that. Do sure. you know if the students um, are given that formula when they come in? Do they know to expect to do nine hours outside of class on a three hour course? Because I feel like I'm constantly running into students that are taking 17 hours and trying to work 40. You know, and it's like that math doesn't work. It doesn't. It doesn't. Um, um, I, I think it's one of those things that um, if everybody in your family went to college before you, then yeah, you may have that bit of, of information. If you are a first generation college student or a returning student, you may not know that. Um, it's in university policy. I'm going to just guess that most new students don't sit down on their congratulations, you've been admitted to the institution and then go read university policy. Um, I, I mean, I, that's my guess. Um, and especially for um, first generation and first time freshmen, they're going from a structure um, where things were much more controlled um, in the K-12 or P-12 environment um, and how information and time is spent. Um, so they don't necessarily know. Uh, it wouldn't be a horrible idea to have that conversation with them in your introduction in the very first course, um, the very first class, the very first day when you're talking about, hey, welcome to my class. Uh, you know, maybe add in that additional, this is the um, expectation of time. I, I've heard forever um, that you're expected for every hour to spend two to three hours outside of class, but I couldn't tell you where I heard that the first time. Um, and for me, my father was a faculty member, so I could have heard that when I was five years old, sitting in the middle of the living room, hanging out with my dad. Um, so I don't really know when it was that that information came to me, which gets us back to that knowledge void. Um, you know, we don't know that they don't know. Um, and so maybe we do need to be more clear about letting them know that yes, this is an expectation um, for the institution. Um, though I would imagine with the last year and a half that people have slightly different expectations coming out of K-12 than they used to. So we might have a slightly different understanding as new groups of students come in. But that's a good question. My guess is they don't know. Um, so it's probably our responsibility to tell them. That would be um, a good thing to add into orientation. Yeah it would be a great thing for them to add into orientation. Um, and I guess it's possible they might actually already do that. Um, I don't know. 
but it's been again a really long time since I went to new student orientation <laughs> at any university um and I have not done it at MTSU um so I don't know, maybe we can all go to orientation this year and see uh but it's probably something we should put places uh, maybe that's something as MTSU online redesigns their website we could throw that up there is some information that's just helpful to know um, okay, so let's go ahead and look um, briefly at the um, Excel chart. Um, Tara said that she had put that in the chat for y'all to look at when the blasting happened and I uh, went away. Um, and yes, there uh, is a tab for graduate and there is a tab for undergraduate. And I'm going to tell you the secret as to why one has modules, six modules and one has four. If she didn't tell you, it's because when you actually physically print it, it prints on one page instead of having like weird documents <laughs> merging onto other pages where you're like, why is there this one column that just took up a whole page? That's the only reason. There's really no special secret that we're trying to make you have four, four modules or six modules. It really is, it prints pretty. Um, so that's it. You can add as many modules as you want uh, to make it match your course. Uh, but this is a chart that, um, years and years ago, uh, and I try to update it when I can, but it's one that was developed from multiple resources um, early on in my instructional design career because I was, I was having a hard time really processing how we measure uh, instruction and in online and I needed a better understanding of that. Um, so this is one that's kind of just come together from a bunch of different resources, uh, but it really does actually go through and, and it tells you a bunch of different activities. It then explains that activity and then it will actually um, tell you, and I guess I need to actually make it a little bit bigger so that y'all can see it. Um, and then it actually tells you about how much to equate in terms of time. Um, now this one is, um, it, you can do the whole 135 with this if you want to, or you can really focus on ones that might be considered contact um, and how we create those levels of contact and engagement and really aim for like that 45. Um, so really how you do this Excel document is, is up to you and you can process that however you want, um, but you don't necessarily have to add in your reading on this one if you know what your reading is gonna be based on that course load estimator. Um, so this one really is intended to be much more for equating an activity and online to what it would be like if it was face-to-face. -face. Um, so if we were doing this in our face-to-face -face class, this is how much time it would have been. Um, and some of the things to think about with this are, um, you know, how much, if they took 15 minutes to take a, a quiz face-to-face, -face, it's 15 minutes online or remote. Um, it's um, if, you have a video that you add in there and that video is 12 minutes long, that's 12 minutes. Um, an hour long lecture is really hard for, for people to watch on a video. So if you wanna have an hour worth of lecture, break it up into like four or five shorter videos. Uh, Cause our, our own cognitive load because we've all grown up on TV is only somewhere between seven and 14 minutes because we need a commercial break. Um, cause that's how our brains work. Um, so thinking about those things. So I wanted to show you this chart because I wanted to give you something you really could sit down and think about that. It also gives you some great options for possible activities within your course and ways to create that engagement, um, and produce opportunities for students to communicate with you and with each other, um, and potentially think outside of, um, back in the in the way back um correspondence courses that was read this write this mail it back in um online learning is not correspondency it really does thrive on that engagement that we create between ourselves and our students and the engagement that students create between each other so how are we helping them get those activities and connecting with each other um so do y'all have questions about that the Excel document. I know that I can go through and show it to you. Oh, and it does tabulate. Um, if you scroll all the way down to the bottom, it will actually tabulate for you. Um, I, there's like a, look, I can't, I can't use my mouse. But it'll tabulate for you. Um, it's the fanciest thing I've ever done in Excel. 
Uh, I'm not your Excel go-to person. <laughs> That's not, there are people that are really good at that. This is just a, an example and a way to, to use it, but it will add it up for you and it'll help you kind of get an idea of that time. Um, so are there any questions about the Excel document before we pop back? As we're popping back, Mm -hmm. There doesn't seem to be any questions about the document. Can you speak a little bit about to the 135 hours for accelerated classes, like three it's, weeks? Mm -hmm. it's, it's the same. It's the same. It's 135 hours, whether it is three weeks, five weeks, six, seven, 14. It's 135 hours. Um, the, the one thing to think about that, though, in terms of if it is a, a shortened time span, the students don't have as much time between learning opportunities to process the previous one. Um, so thinking about that in terms of, of that cognitive load and where they're getting, you really got to make sure that you're prioritizing what are the things that I need them to know at the end of this. And maybe they don't have a long-term memory of every single detail but maybe from this course, they have a, a general understanding of the information, but most importantly, they know where to go back and get it if they don't remember it, uh, like they know where to find the resource or they know how to apply it. Um, some courses work better in accelerated than others. Um, some learners do better in accelerated than others. Um, and really kind of thinking about that with um, how you are helping them through their course and their cognitive load, but it is 135 hours regardless um, until our accreditation decides to change it. Um, but I haven't heard recently that SACS is planning to do that. So um, uh, at yeah. least for now, it's still 135. And Kim, just a thought there, the, a, a three week course, if you give 21 days, 135 divided by 21, it's roughly 6.5. So 6.5 hours per day, every day per class. So imagine someone saying they're going to take two three-week classes in a summer session. I, I know that would probably not happen here, but even if you just took one, six and a half hours every day, you know, including Saturday and Sunday for three weeks. Yeah, no, that's very true. Thank you. It's, I mean, that's a lot. When they say, I can do two, uh, <laughs> yeah. you Probably want to have that conversation with them. Thank and, you, Trey. Yeah. And 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 a job for some people. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that is one of the things. Um, and when we first switched um back in you know a thousand years ago in March of 2020, and we first switched um to everything being remote, there there were a lot of, of comments from uh, parents and students about they didn't know they would have to work this hard. Um, and a lot of that information did also come from when we heard that we were like, you know, we need to make sure people are getting that. And we tried to get that information out there, whether people saw it or not, I don't know. But um, if, if you have suddenly had to move home um, after you've been living in a residence hall and our residence hall shut down and you suddenly have to move home and you're suddenly in your parents' space um, and they want you to work or care, help care for younger siblings or things while everybody is initially going through the remote process. If it's 135 hours per course and you're taking 15 hour, 15 hours of courses, that is a actual full-time job. It actually equates out to be like 38 point. I don't, I'm not the math. Somebody else is good at math. Y'all go for it. Um, it's like, it's, a full-time job that it works out to be if you are taking a full-time student load it is a full-time job um, and a lot of times people really don't think about that and so if you are working a full-time job and you have a family to care for uh, in either direction children or parents um, or both um, and you are a full-time student yeah, you won't struggle. You need to make sure you're taking some of those self-care classes that the counseling center offers because you are going to be overwhelmed. Um, and a lot of that has to have conversations that as faculty members need to be aware um, of what that looks like in a full-time load as a student in addition to working full-time. 
sometimes we need to think about how our advisors and things like that are thinking about communicating that information to you and making sure that our students really do know this is a full-time job. You are not just a full-time student for financial aid purposes. It is a full-time job. Um, so hope that that helps, right? Self-care. Uh, what other questions do y'all have? Because that is pretty much um, the end of my presentation. So um, really the, the gist of it is kind of think about how we learn, think about what we're learning and how we're, we're going back over that information, and then thinking about whether or not we're a novice or an expert um, and how that learning process is for us. Uh, and then thank you for joining. We're so glad you could be here today. And does anybody have any questions, anything I can go back over? I've not done a good job of looking at the chat, mostly because when my internet shut down, I lost the chat. So. <laughs> We're good on chat. Okay. Awesome. Well, we have, um, it's about time, but um, if y'all have some questions, please feel free uh, to ask them now. And um, I am willing to stay on for a little bit if y'all have additional questions. I don't. I'm good with that. I'm here for y'all. Kim, I did have a question. Is there a specific online orientation for students who take most of their classes online? Yes, there is. We actually do have a MTSU online orientation. Uh, you can, I don't know that it's on our website. The students uh, get it through an email and it's a, a portal kind of uh, environment that they complete. Um, but right. yes, and they do. All right, and in it, do, do y'all, does it talk about the expectations, of an, uh, time expectations? Because I mentioned in the chat, I don't think you saw it, um, that the consistent problem that I have with my students is that they, you know, we're native online, we're not hybrid, we're not remote, it is online. Mm -hmm. They really think, many of them, that they'll spend an hour a week. And when yeah. I and that hour is at 11 p.m. when things are due at 11.59. Right, right. Yeah. exactly. And when I'm like, you know, I have it in my syllabus and I, you know, have a little email I send out that, and I remind them throughout the semester, this is the same as a face-to-face -face class. And you need to have that same amount of time set aside in your week that, you know, I don't care how you break it up, you know, as long as you turn your assignments in on time, you know, if, if 12.30 is what works for you, you go for it. But you need to have three hours of class time plus your outside meeting time. So maybe five hours you've got to set aside for this class. And they act like I am delusional and the most horrible person that's ever walked the face of the earth. Because they really don't think an online class requires the same amount of commitment as a face-to-face -face class. And I don't, some of them get it, but some of them just don't. And I don't, I don't know how to get it through their heads that they have to do this. And so it is listed in, in a lot of places that it's specific. I don't know how many, and I'll have to go back and look at that orientation, but I don't know if we actually say the 135 hour part, but we do talk about that they need to log in, you know, three days, at least three days a week, that they need to commit time the same as if the time was face to face um, and, you know, how to, to kind of go through that process. Some of that, I, I, think may just be they have to hear it a lot or they have to experience the mistake um which i know we don't like our students to not be super successful and we want to help them get to that place but sometimes we do actually have to let them have a little boo-boo so that they learn um and move forward with that um but i'll check on that 135 thing um we'll make a note of it and i'll check and see if it's there Kim, let's make sure we do get in that into our orientation and also for our IDs that they um, strongly suggest to our faculty that they include a, a phrase like that in their syllabus yeah. about you know total hours. Yeah, no problem. Also that, included in the template as well and is, is actually on my notes from when we did the orientation. There's actually a little note on here. <laughs> We've just not had a chance to yet talk about that. Very good. <laughs> Very good. The more time people hear it, the better, you know. Right. And right. that, that benefits everybody. It gets it from short term to long term. That, that's what we talked about in the very beginning. <laughs> Full circle. <laughs> what other questions does everybody have? Um, well, Ken, um, Dr. Rodriguez was talking about studio art classes that are sure. three credits, right? So the class session runs for three hours and asking questions about 
how would that work out for additional hours outside of the classroom? Um, so in my response, we talked about, you know, are they doing readings? Are they designing outside of the classroom to some extent before they actually get into the studio? You know, brainstorming, that kind of thing. Do you have anything that you want to add to that? Well, a lot of that does have to, when I said the 45 and the, the 90 to get to 135, um, that has to do with ones that are uh, traditional courses in terms of you are only in class one hour um so um that's where like one hour three times a week if you are in class for two hours three times a week then that actually means that instead of 45 you're sitting at 90 already um so kind of thinking about that in terms of how your course is structured um and the way it's phrased is that it's it's a um in policy it's the the face-to-face time plus the additional time outside to get to 135 so if you are are in your course for for three hours uh, and you are a three hour course then you probably are already at your time um so that is something to think about with that and you may want to double check how that's written um for your department specifically uh provost office will have some of that information if your department doesn't. Does that help? I hope. Yes. Thank okay. you. Yeah, no problem. What other questions does anybody have? I also could probably stop sharing. Stop I can't. Um, I have a question, but I, I want you to turn the uh, record off because this isn't, um, it's not related to this, what you're talking Absolutely. about. Absolutely. Yeah, you and I have been going back and forth on email. So now that